morning, church family. Sounds like y'all are having a really good time, and I hate to interrupt, but we're going to get started here. So if you would, uh, stand to your feet, and uh, we'll begin uh, our worship service by uh, praising God through song. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that you are here that you promise where even two or three of us are gathered, that your presence is, is with us gathered. So we quiet our souls through the caffeine and sugar. We quiet our souls and we, we thank you that you are here. And we, we are honored and help us to pay homage to you this morning, to bring an acceptable praise from sincere hearts that would bring honor and glory to you through this whole service. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. She 
Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church, and we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our one sentence where, where it says you're, uh, you're leaving by the green pastures and the still waters. It's the same sentence as through the valley. That the same shepherd that leads us through the green pastures and still waters in the good times is the same shepherd who also will lead us through valleys. And um, I just wanted to share that. I thought that was a um, really neat thought.
Chains are real.
thank you for your goodness and that you're with us always through the valleys and on the mountaintop. That no matter what circumstances we encounter, your promises always hold true. And even when we feel forgotten or overlooked, we are not. We are always seen by you. We're always loved by you. And we thank you for your radical goodness and mercy to us. This is our three-minute shuffle. We're going to take a short break, so chance to greet someone around you, um, refill your coffee cup, say hi to one another. We'll be back shortly. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Good morning. Woohoo! All right, welcome to Element Church. Everybody's well caffeinated and sugared up. <laughs> All right, I just have a few announcements. I'll be going through the in the loop. If you have any questions about anything, they'll be on our social media and on our app and on our website, so you can't miss it. Uh, first, we have students. You have youth group uh, this Wednesday from 7 to 9. That's for grades 6 through 12. 
Uh, community groups are still happening. I know that a few are taking little breaks for like the summertime. Um, so if you wanna just touch base with your community group leader um, and they'll be communicating that with you. Uh, we have Monday prayer tomorrow. So what that is is we open up our church in the sanctuary from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. You can come in anytime and pray, read your Bible, um, worship. There's always good worship music on that's nice and loud. Um, so you can come in anytime and do that. And then um, just one little side note for our family. Um, at this time, if you have any needs that, um, that you have or that somebody has in the church, if you would just direct those to either me or any one of our elder team um, at this at this point, what we're trying to do is we're just trying to slowly have our pastor enter back in. So we just don't want him bombarded with all the different things um, when we know where we can direct those as well. So if you didn't, don't mind doing that, you can see me, you can shoot us an email, you can um, call the office. So that's just what we're asking to do at this time. So Joe, I'll have you come up. We have a triple baby dedication today. So Joe's going to take that. So. <laughs> I'd like to invite the uh, Miller family to come up, Rob and Tiffany, along with their three daughters and any uh, friends, family who would like to join them. This is Rob and Tiffany Miller, and along with their three daughters, Reagan here in the front. <laughs> and I know that it's Austin and Kennedy, but I'm not sure I can say which is which. <laughs> That's Austin. That's Austin. <laughs> okay. Kennedy might be on a short leash here. Yeah, she's eating, so. <laughs> um, as I was think, thinking about... Uh, dedicating these kids that I, I um, thought of Psalm 139 that says for you formed my inward parts you knitted me together in my mother's womb my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me when as yet there were none of them how precious to me are your thoughts O God how vast is the sum of them I think it's neat to think about how these lives, these kids of yours, that even before you knew that they were coming into the world, that these verses show that God was there forming them, putting them together, unformed substance, before they even looked like a human, that he was there working, knitting them together into the fashion that he wanted to make them, the personalities, the looks, all those things. And... Um, so we praise God with you for these uh, lives that he's given you. And these verses show that the kids are truly a gift from God, that they're not really ours, but we're giving them to steward and as a trust to take care of them. And we know we fall short. It's hard to know what to do all the time and how to parent them correctly. So we want to take this chance to dedicate them to the Lord and call on his help to help help you guys and help us all as a church family to help bring them up in the right way. So I have a couple questions for you, uh, Tiffany and Rob. Do you today recognize these children as the gifts of God and give heartfelt thanks for God's blessing? Do you now dedicate your children to the Lord who gave them to you, surrendering all worldly claims upon their lives in the hope that they will belong wholly to God? Do you pledge as parents that with God's fatherly help, you will bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, making every reasonable effort with patience and love to build the word of God, the character of Christ, and the joy of the Lord into their lives? And now for uh, Element Church family, I have a, have a uh, question for you. We know it's our responsibility to also... Uh, shepherd these kids and bring them up that they'll be in Sunday school they'll be here in these services later they'll be in community groups they'll be we're a primary community that they will grow up in and a 
and a big influence on them. So it's our job to model um, godly character, to be an example in word and in deed of, of, of what uh, living a godly life looks like, and to help the Miller family to serve them in any way we can when, they, when we see that they have needs that we can help with. So if, if, if you are willing to do that, would you respond by saying, we do? All right, would you stand, uh, stand with us and stretch out your hands towards these uh, little girls and we'll pray a blessing over them. God, we thank you for, for these young lives that you brought into the world, that you fashioned and put together and now we see here before our eyes. And God, we pray for Reagan, for Kennedy, and for Austin, that you would bless them. Thank you for making them and now we ask that you would bless their lives in every way that you would increase them. We ask that they would be yours and that you would use them for your purposes. We ask that you would shower your goodness and your grace on them, that you would keep them from harm and from evil, and that the days of their lives could be filled with blessing and that they could one day inherit your eternal kingdom. We pray for their parents, their grandparents, and everyone else that has a part in their lives in raising them, that you would give wisdom and strength and godly guidance. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. And we do have a gift for each of your da daughters here. This is for the older one. Reagan, this is for you. It's a, it's a storybook. It's a little Bible. This time, would like to invite the elder team to come up. I'd like to invite Colin up. This is Kalyn. I think everybody pretty much knows who she is. Um, she'll be leaving on Thursday to go back on the mission field. And she's going to Romania again. And we're going to miss her greatly. I'm sure her parents will really miss her greatly. <laughs> but, you know, she's, she's taken on a role that most of us would be scared to death to do. I know I would be. And I'm not proud of that. I, but I commend her for what she does and what she's doing. I mean, it's amazing a young lady leaving, going across the, across the country, or across the world to bring about the Lord's work. And that just, that floors me, and I'm proud of her. I'm not even her dad, but I've known her a long, <laughs> long time. But I'm very proud of her. She's, she's a, a great woman. So let's pray for Clint. Father in heaven, we just praise and thank you for this uh, young lady and her commitment to you, Lord. Um, it's, just, it's just so great and enlightening to see. We pray that you would go before her, Father. We pray that you would bless her time there. We pray that you would keep her safe there. Uh, we pray that you are already softening hearts, that she would be able to come into these young people's lives and change their lives and see you and know what it is to love you, to um, just follow your ways, Lord. We just praise and thank you for them. I also pray for Lixie, and uh, we just pray for her also in the same way, Lord. Give them strength and give them the will. Um, help them not to be too homesick <laughs> And just love on their time there, Lord. We just praise and thank you for your blessings, for your uh, wisdom, for your, for your patience for us, Lord. We just thank you and praise you. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Happy Easter. <laughs> um, it's been a joy to sit under Joe. Um, it's been a joy to see our elders pray. It's been a joy to see um, the body be the body. That's always been our hope. Is uh, I just didn't forget what Joe said at the beginning. I think it best that we continue to go forth and to see what the Lord has for us. Let that be our anthem today. Amen. Um, I want to invite my friend Josh Hayworth uh, to the front. Amen. Let's give him a good welcome. Um, it's good to have guys like Josh and other men in the church who are willing to come in and share the gospel so that we continue to move forward and see what God has for us, see what God's going to do for us. Um, today, I... I I hope that our hearts are open. I hope that you're ready, not just to, um, not just to um, um, see what God does, but that you're ready for God to do something in your life. You know what I mean? There's there's an expectation that we should all come with every week that God do something in my life. Don't let me leave this place the same way I left out. Amen. Um, can we stretch a hand out to this brother and give him a prayer today and just encourage him? Father, we thank you for Josh. Uh, we thank you, God, for the word that you've birthed in him. We thank you, God, that, um, that you have good plans for us today. We thank you that the word that is going to come forth is going to change us. We come with expectation knowing that you are the king of glory and that when we come to you, we don't leave empty-handed. So we thank you for Josh. We thank you for the anointing on him. We thank you for the spirit of God that is alive in him. And we draw on that, Lord. Uh, encourage Josh. I pray that your spirit would be like a blanket over him as he's up here, Lord. And as he um, proclaims the gospel, Lord, that he's reminded that he's among family and friends. That we just come to the table hungry. And we know that the, the Bible is our substance. That the, the gospel is our food. So we thank you for our friend who comes to help us eat today and that we would be full and changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Got it. Got it. This contraption is new. You can hear me? I hope. It sounds like it's roaring. Um, thanks, Wade. I'm actually real glad to be up here. I'm tired about I'm tired of thinking about it and I want to share it <laughs> so um, last week I wasn't here so I, w I didn't really know what went down I mean Wade had his episode on Saturday night and um, the first automatic response my when I heard is like I need to help and I was like I can call Wade and Carly but probably not the best thing to do so I called Mike Poppy and he because he's my um, you know, my son's married into his family, so I, I know him, and so I called, talked to him, and he's like, no, you need to call one of the elders. I'm like, okay. Well, I know Mike Cantor's. I have had history with him, so I'll call him and figure out that there's a need. I'm only a stone throw away from Wade, and he lives right down, you know, a street from me. I thought, well, shoot, I can make mashed potatoes and bring it to him. Um, and, and right away, Mike was like, oh, we need someone to preach, you can preach. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I, got, I got home, and I was like, oh, Mike wants me to preach, Jess. And I thought, why would he think that? And he's like, don't you remember you preached back in that little Sealy church, and you were the youth pastor? And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's why Mike <laughs> thought that. <laughs> so, Wade, here's your mashed potatoes. Um... <laughs> so when you know I haven't I haven't preached much um, I've done a lot of teaching uh, I used to be I give you a little history I know a lot of you here but I don't know many of you here I w we've only been here about a year um, in um, attending and uh, I've done teaching and what brought us to Hayward here is there's a one-year Bible program that ran out of Lake uh, Lake Owen some of you might know about it in the Genaxis camp up there called Wisconsin Wilderness Campus. And I was uh, called to be a part of that program. I went to that program. and I, um, So I was called to come back to Wisconsin, which I love. I grew up in Indiana. 
had no desire to be in cornfields. I wanted to be in the woods. And so I loved this atmosphere, just um, everything about it. Um, so I've had the context of teaching, run small groups, um, mainly with young people, college age students. And it was just, uh, it was just a passion of mine. And today, as I, was, as I was thinking about what to say, how to say it, should I say in the text where the, the church, the body is in, should I go into another thing that I know better, that I've already taught about and whatnot? And, you know, I, I, I really thought I, I, didn't, I need to pray about this. I don't know. Um, and I need to read the scripture. That was the first thought um, on Tuesday when I really started hammering things out. And um, so I, I just delve into the scripture and I started reading in particular Mark because that's where we're at. We're in Mark, talking about two daughters um, and Jesus' interaction with them. So I would, that's where I want to start. I better get my notes out, or um, I better look at my watch. Okay, there you go. Um, so I can stay on track. So anytime, just in my personal study, and I think, I think the Lord's called me just to, I'm just a, a basic contractor. I'm, I'm a lay person. I, and I'm just, I just felt like I just need to share what I do to stay on track with the Lord. And um, this is what I do. And so when I heard I needed to talk about Scripture, I thought I need to go and pray. And I, it's, it's going to be up in front of you. And I'm going to read uh, portions of, of this story um, that's, that's in the midst of the Gospels. So Mark 5.21 before you, the text that we're reading is Mark, and I better put nine because I didn't know how I was going to look when I was up here. Or Mark four, sorry. Um, or Mark five. I'm already there. You go. Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. When Jesus had gone across over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus. Came And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in a crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had been happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to him, the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they completely were astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. In Matthew 9, verse 
18 through 23. While he was saying this, again, I'm going to, sounds like I'm repeating myself. I've been doing it all week, so I'll just keep on doing it. I, I mean, I've read through this a lot. <laughs> so anyhow, so you're just going to have to bear with me. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and said to his disciples, Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, she said to herself If only I can touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw a noisy crowd of people playing, a, playing pipes, he said, Go away, the girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put aside outside, he went in, took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread all, of, all around that region. There's another account in Luke. Um, Matthew's actually the shortest account. And there's another account in Luke which is very similar to, uh, to Mark's account. Um, and so we, we read those three accounts. And I read and I prayed and I read. And I was like, oh, Lord, where do you want me to go with this one? There's a lot of stuff in here to go with. Um, the first title of my message, which I scrapped, was called The Two Daughters, because there's two daughters involved in the story, and Joe shared last week about the first daughter, the daughter of the bleeding, and she came in behind Jesus, and there's so much symbolism there, and so much like, wow, an unclean woman coming to touch Jesus, that's not done in that time. Um, so there's so much stuff there, and then you have a synagogue leader who is supposed to be clean, right, and does everything right, according to the system, is coming in front of Jesus, and demands for his daughter, comes on intercession, and, and tells Jesus, basically, come to my house, instead of going behind Jesus. So there's so much there, and Joe shared some, some of that already, which is just great stuff that we can just pick at and think about and, and apply to our own lives. Um, but I decided not to go there, because I was like, all right, Joe talked about it a little bit. I wasn't there, but I did listen to his message, and I was like, all right, I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. So the second idea I had was, and forgive me if this is, I don't cuss that much, but I said, that really what it should be is the hell with death. And I, I, I say that because the story here ends with resurrection. Jesus is moving towards his own resurrection. I firmly believe that Jesus was, moving in a way that he was doing these miracles for a reason and for a purpose and everything he said was for a purpose and he conquered death and so I started I was like oh this is good stuff we can talk about death here and, and how Jesus conquered it because this is what it's about this is about Jesus conquering sin and death and he's doing it in a physical way and now he's going to do it in a spiritual way in his spiritual resurrection in a different way Jesus came back with a spiritual body, not a resurrected body, physical body. I thought, oh, I could do that. And then I started studying that. I was like, I better let Wade handle that one. Um, and I was getting really off on rabbit trails, and everyone would be sleeping by the time I was done. So I was there on Wednesday or Thursday going, oh, what, Lord, what do you want me to speak about? And I really want to stick in this text because it's really starting to bother me, and it's really starting to speak to me. Um, and so, as I was praying, the one thing that stood out is, uh, as I kept rereading and rereading this, the thing that stuck out the most was Jesus was on a mission. He was moving with impact. I mean, he was, he was on fire. I don't know how to tell you. If you read through the Gospels, he had 30 years of his life, and he was... You know, he did a certain thing that we don't know much about, really. But in the last three years of his life, we have four different accounts on it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, we, it, so we have these accounts, and it's just three years of his life. And so it, we come to the middle of this 
of this time where Jesus is going back and forth on these lakes, and he's, you know, people are, it's like, I, you know, people are meeting him before he even gets off the boat. I don't know how they did that. They didn't have texting and phone calls and stuff. I don't know if the boats were racing ahead of him and re- telling the people he's coming and the disciples weren't rowing fast enough. I don't know what was going on, but, you know, he was stepping on land and people were just there waiting for him to speak and heal and touch them and, and change their life. And as I thought about that, I'm like, how did he do that? I know he is God, right? But he was also human. How did this human man do this? And so it, it brought me back to my own personal story, and I don't typically like to get up and talk about a text and bring my personal life into it, but the Lord just kept wrestling with me this week going, Josh, it's time for you to share a little bit. So here I'm going to share a little bit. Um, so Jesus was on mission. And there was a point in my life, I grew up in a Christian home. I have beautiful parents. It's going to be all worked up. This is why I don't want to share about it, because it really hits hard at home. Um, so if you're praying for me, just pray that I can actually talk during this message. Um, so anyhow, there was a point in my life parents are awesome. My dad's a youth pastor. My dad's an associate pastor. I knew everything. And I, I did a real good job of faking it. I'd put it that way. And I was probably considered the leader of my youth group. And, but I was not following the Lord as a disciple. Um, I was into sports. I was into everything that you would do in high school. And, you know, I had a relationship I should not have been in. Um, my parents thought I was doing one thing, and I was doing another thing. I was lying to them. I don't even want to get into details about it. That's not what this point is about. Main point was that I was not on mission. And it came to a point in my life where I had to leave my parents. I mean, I went to college. And um, there was a point in my life when that someone asked me to go on a canoe trip. And... I was in a reality of like, oh, Lord, I'm, i got to figure this out. Do I really believe what I've been taught my whole life, or am I going to just go off and do this worldly thing? And that was just my thinking. And so this guy invited me on this canoe trip, and he said, because I wanted to do this summer camp thing, and he said, no, you need to go on this canoe trip first. It's like, okay, I love canoe, and I'm from Indiana. I would love to experience this whole canoe thing. And so, yeah, I went on this trip, and the Lord met me there. It's a long story. If you want to hear my full testimony, you can have to call me up and go for a cup of coffee. But what happened on that canoe trip? God met me. That's all I can say, is that a spiritual light came on, and I repented, and I did a full 180 in my life. A full 180 included going back home, changing colleges, changing friend groups, saying you know, changing a relationship I was, was not right, hurting people, doing things that it's like, I don't even know how I did it because the Spirit of God was working in my life. So I did these things. My mission just radically changed. It was a totally 180, and um, what I did was repent and believe the actual thing that, been, that was taught me. So parents, if you have a child that you feel like not getting it, Believe me, it, it works. Because <laughs> when I looked at my parents' life, that's what did it. I looked at their life and said, they really believe this stuff. And it changed my life. And, um, and then once, once I got a hold of it, I had it up here. I knew all the answers. I told, my, I told my testimony to people. They believed me. But it wasn't here yet. I hadn't experienced a transformation yet. Um, so that was the beginning. There's a whole lot there. But that was the beginning of my mission as Jesus was on mission all of a sudden I started experiencing the same mission. Um, and so in 2 Corinthians, I don't know if that can be up here, uh, it's a passage that I, that, I, that I, on this canoe trip, came to light, and I just want to read it because it's kind of my, my, my go-to when, when I get down or um, things start really getting hard. At the end, you know, I was, I was actually on this canoe trip. I was plunked on an island for seven hours, and, and they, you know, people were working on me. Um, 
and this is the passage that we had to read. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though our outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. When I read that, and all of a sudden it just became a light switch in my head. Um, basically, I said, I, I, I'm wasting away. I'm going to die. <laughs> I mean, that age. What, that, I think I was 19 at that time. I was like, I, I am not living for the Lord. <laughs> I better get this right because it's going to go quick. And now I stand up in front of you at, at age 50. I'm 49, but my voice is 50. Um, it has gone quick. I have four children. Um, three of them are married, and one is working on getting married. <laughs> um, two grandchildren, two, one on the way. It's like, it has gone quick. Um, and I, I remember sitting on that island, looking at the sky, going, and it just, I mean, I was on my knees. In this passage, you have two people coming at their, on their knees and just begging the Lord Jesus. I was on my knees at that point, just crying, Lord, I'm so sorry for, for wasting my life, for all the opportunities I had to share Jesus with people, and here I am, so selfish. And so, I was on my knees at that point, and, and this passage just, just clearly states that, that, that there's two forces going at it, the seen and the unseen things in life. And I was just basically living for the, un, for the seen things and not for the unseen. The other quality that it, as, as I looked at Jesus, when he's going through these experiences, he's on mission, so he's got a focal point. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he's intent about it. And he's taking his disciples through it. Um, and in, in uh, Mark one thirty five, I just want to read this one passage. In Mark one thirty five, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And there's moments in my life when I have to do this. I mean, I love being with people, but my first and foremost relationship is with the Lord. I got to get it right with Him. Now, if I don't do that, I am no good for people. <laughs> um, and he's, I was reading, uh, I mean, I've been to Element for a year now, and one of the Element's main main uh, mission, so if we want to have a mission, mi you know, Elmet has a mission statement, and forgive me if I botch her to get it wrong, but this is what I'm looking at it as, we don't do life alone. Um, we love God, love people, and love others, right? So it's, it, that's, and, and make disciples. First part of that is loving God, which is getting alone, and being with God. And a lot of that you know, when I looked at that, that Jesus had to get alone, then obviously I need to get alone. If Jesus had to do it as a, as a, a human, then I need to get alone and have some soul, soul searching going on. And, and so, I mean, when Jesus is going through these events, you wonder, like, how, did, how was this stuff automatic? And so I'm reading through this, this, this one event of, he, the, of the healing, the statements that he said, um, the interactions that he said. A woman kind of tugs on him, feels the power going out. It's like, what's going on here? Everything's automatic. It's not even a thought. I mean, Jesus just says, hold on, Jairus. I got someone. I need to have another conversation here. And these conversations are coming out of his head. It's like, where does this all come from? Well, it's, one is his time alone with the Father. He's in right relationship with the Father. He doesn't have sin bearing him down. Um, and so there, there's just a number of things there. So it's um, what I want to really share is today is that um, we have to take care of these things. We have to take care of our relationship with the Father, and we also have to take care of our relationship with others, and we have to 
and we have to go out and do as Jesus did. And so it's, um, and so you have to find your quiet place. I wrote some points down. I'll keep coming back to them because they say only 5% of what I say is going to be caught anyhow. So I'll, I'll just keep restating things. Um, you have to have a mission. You've got to have a quiet place where you reconnect with the Father and remind yourself of the mission. That's what I, that's what I do. I'm, maybe I'm not telling you to do that, but um, that's just what I do. Um, and then you, the third point is you've got to take action. <laughs> you just can't do that and not do anything, right? You've got you to do something with that. And as a believer, those who, those who have walked this journey, have walked this faith, you know you just can't hold it in. It's got to come out. It just started oozing. It's just, it's just there, right? So it's like, I, I got to do something. As Jesus was walking and, and as people were tugging him, as he's, you know, as he's reading this story, uh, it's, it's like coming out of a concert and like, you remember you're doing that and it's like, you're just kind of walking like this and it's like, how am I going to get out of here? And people are just smashing against him and even the disciples said, how did you know someone tugged on you? It's like, I just felt the power go out of me. And then he was even talking about, you know, demon. he's coming from a demon possessed. And he's just like, there's so much going on that he had to be on mission and he had to have a quiet time with his father to get her, to, to recalibrate his, his thoughts. Um, but Jesus took action. And so a verse that, that uh, or a passage that really, that I pray I guess in my mind, every morning, in my quiet time, because my quiet time pretty much consists of the morning. Um, I get up 5.30, 6 o'clock, and I just, sometimes I read, sometimes I pray. I I really work hard not to think about work. I just have moments of silence and solitude and just being able to let the Lord just just fill me and and just what my day should look like. And... um, one of the prayers that I say is in Galatians, and, and this is something that uh, a mentor of mine back when I was um, in 19 or 20 um, kind of taught me or just kind of, he didn't even teach me, he just kind of read the text to me, and I was like, oh, that's, that's, that's good. And it just stuck with me. So it's in Galatians. So if you have a Bible, it's not going to be up there. I don't think I gave this to anybody. Um, but it's right here. You just got to find it. And I have to find it. It's even harder to find stuff when you're up here. Um, so in Galatians 5, and actually this, this thought process is actually in Colossians and Philippians and Galatians because Paul's talking to the churches saying this is what we need to do. Um, is this what it is? see here. I'm sorry. I don't think Galatians 5. I don't want that yet. Uh, I want Colossians. I believe it. Don't worry. I'll find myself. Um, Colossians 4, 2 through 6. I had to go back to like the, 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 the revised things. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Paul is talking to the, to the church here. He says, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for, for us that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer everyone. There's three things in here that really just hits me hard. One is that we need to be praying for opportunities to share the gospel. And because he says that right there, he says that, and he says, pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message. The second thing is that 
we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. So we need to have the clarity. It says to have to be clear that we try to exp- that we explain the gospel clearly. So this this message. But in order to do that, you better know your mission. When you go to people, when people come and ask you, well, what do you know? It's like, what's my go back? Like, what am I doing again in this life? Why am I here? It's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The mission, the mission that Jesus came. That's why I'm here. And I find when I'm not ready to give an answer, that's probably because I didn't have my quiet time or I didn't have my alone time with Jesus, put it that way. Then I'm stumbling over words going, uh, I'm not ready. So pray for an opportunity. Pray that you can be clear to reveal that mystery, that gospel to, to others. And then the fourth one is, or the third thing is to be bold. You've got to be bold to do this. I mean, as in this passage, we look at it and goes, they laughed at him. <laughs> so you've got to be bold in order to do this. We don't like people laughing at us, right? Um, that was even people in, in, in the church, you'd call it, because it was synagogue leaders. You know, if you read the text and talk about it, it's like these are people that are within the church. They come in, whatever. And they laughed at him. And Jesus like, ignored them. What gave the, the thought, like, Jesus, Jesus ignored him. It says that in, in, in Mark. If we go back to Mark, um, which I thought was interesting. I might be jumping ahead in my notes, but here it is. It's coming. Um, so just to restate what we just talked about in Colossians is that um, I don't want to get ahead here. I want to I want to focus on this because I think it's really important that within our time alone with the Father, you need to pray for an opportunity. You need to pray that you that you take that opportunity and speak it clearly to people, and you need to pray for boldness. Now. There's times in my life going, I don't really don't want to pray that because it comes true. <laughs> All of a sudden, when you pray these things and you're asking for opportunities and you're asking to be bold about it and you're asking to be clear about it, your day becomes a different world <laughs> as Jesus' world. It starts, things start opening up. You start looking in the eyes of people. You're kind of looking for an opportunity but you don't really want it there. You're like, yeah, I don't want it. But you need boldness. You need clarity. So just, be, just, just know, if you make this prayer a normal pattern in your life, things will start happening. Um, so let, let's go back to Mark. I want, do want to stay on task a little bit. Um, Mark 5. So the one, the one phrase I just couldn't get past in, in this whole passage, and I wanted to get past it, to be honest with you. I didn't want to talk about it. Um, it says, overhearing what they said to Jesus, overhearing what they said, Jesus told them, don't be afraid, just believe. Um... So the overhearing, really, in my footnotes, says ignoring. So they just told Jesus that, yay, the girl's dead. The daughter's dead. Get on with the show. Like, we've already hired people to cry for you, and that's kind of what they did back then. Um, and Jesus, you know, in his, prob- you know, just in who he was, said, he just ignored that and said, she's not dead. She's just asleep. And then he said, just believe. He said, you know, it's like, I just couldn't get a passage. Don't be afraid, just believe. And so I, I, I really struggled with that one. There's two, there's a, there's a, you'll find out why. Um, I struggle with it because, um, you know, in my personal life, that there's, there's things that happen that really bring you back to your mission 
that make you get alone with the Father and remind yourself what, what we're here for and what's going on. And um, to the one, the, the thing that really, uh, I guess it's hard to share. You can see that I'm stumbling. I don't want to share what I want to, that, you know, what's he going to share? Uh, there's three moments in my life um, besides my moment of conversion that really stand out. Um, the first one was when Aaliyah was born. She's going, oh, great, he's going to talk about me. Don't worry, you didn't remember anything of it. Um, you know, I was 19, or I guess I was 20 at that time, and I was young in my faith. I had already had this conversion of like, all right, I'm on mission. And, you know, we did the whole thing with her birth process. Like, oh, we're doing the natural birth, right? Well, bottom line is everything went haywire. And before you know it, I'm in scrubs. I'm with and my wife's being carted out. We got to do this emergency, you know, situation where they got to cut her open and all that stuff, right? And so I just remember being alone, and I call it a being on my knees moments because I you read Darius is being on his knees and just begging the Lord, and just being in on my knee experience, going, "Oh Lord, this just everything is going crazy. I don't know if I'm going to lose my wife. I'm going to lose the baby." Lord, just, just be with me and, and just, just be with the situation. And pleading. It was just a pleading. I was pleading with the Lord, help. <laughs> so for some reason that sticks in my mind. I just I just I can visualize the whole situation. Just me and my scrubs, me in this this room all by myself, just with the Lord. Um, the second scenario or situation that I, I pretty much fell on my knees is when Jessica had limes, <laughs> and many of you kind of walked that battle through um, it wasn't just limes it became miracle neurological limes and it got to the point where she was in the emergency room got to the point where the kids were sent off to my parents it, was, it just got so like crazy and like unbelievably things were happening so fast that I was like what's going on and I remember at you know, through all the tears and through all the, the unknowns, like, am I going to lose my wife? You know, it's like th that, that fear that comes to you, that don't be afraid. It's like, well, I am afraid. I, I'm, I think I might lose my wife, the one I love, the one I cherish. How am I going to raise three kids without her? All those things just start flooding through your head. And then you just, just believe. Like, okay, Lord. Like, But I came to a moment in, the, in that Literally, I think I was on my knees at, at a point there, and I was crying and just, just like not, not knowing what to do. And it was a, a moment of relent, of going, you, it's okay. I'm not okay, but it's okay. And the Lord's got this. Um, and, and just believe. And I, and, I, and I just had to believe. Through, through those moments, what I've learned and through reading this text again and his reminder is that the Lord has given us um, heaven. It's not something that it's like for me, I don't know what you think, it's not something that's on the clouds. It's not something that like I can't wait until this world's over with so we can go to heaven. It's been given here and now. You know, the, the song the kingdom come song it's like you know we build our church and in our church you know what does it say we are the church and we are the hope on earth we are the hope we, are, we, have, we can give heaven to people um, one, the title that I really wanted to give this one was give them heaven not hell and during his moments of uh just where you just feel like you're falling apart. Life, you're not doing life alone. I had I had the Father with me, but these are ones when heaven starts wrapping you with people, <laughs> and that's where it's that's where it becomes real because you start seeing the people that you've interacted with, the people that you have community with, start giving you a a, a piece of heaven, a glimpse of heaven, and it's, a, it's the most sweetest thing that you can experience. Not that you want to experience this type of stuff, but it's, an, it's, it's something that we can give others, and that we can give heaven to other people, and not hell. 
You know, the term like give them hell, it's like, mm, that's not a good thing. Like, how about give them heaven? <laughs> right? I, the first thing that came to my mind was Rocky. You know, you know you, this goes way back for people. Um, <laughs> but I, I loved Rocky. You know, Balboa, he's going to fight the Russian and whatnot. I just remember the scene where his uh, Mick was in the corner or something like that, and he's like, just go give them hell. You know, and Rocky's like, all right. You know, he's like, why aren't we doing that as, as believers? It's like, just go give them a piece of heaven, right? Whether it's in our church community, whether it's with the people you rub shoulders with on every day, just, just give them a piece of heaven. And guess what? You're not going to be able to do it unless you're on mission, unless you get alone with the Lord, and if you're not in community that's supporting all that. It becomes a lot easier when you're in that community and, it's, and, it, and you're able to do that. Just give them a, a piece of heaven. Um, you pray for opportunity. You pray, you pray that it can be clear. And you pray for boldness that you can share that piece of heaven with people that surround you, that are hurting every day. Even as I was, I was praying this this week and going through this passage, you know, it's, um, I don't know, I was meeting up with a tile guy, and boy, he's just limping in and hope this tile guy's not listening. He probably knows who I am. Um, but I can just tell. He's just having a rough day, or he's, you know, he's towards, he probably shouldn't be tiling because he's older. You know, he's like, they're on their knees. It's just a rough job, that tiling job. You can just sense that he's hurting. And I just remember thinking, Josh, just, just give him a piece of heaven. Just be a light to his world. Just give him a smile. Just give him, like, time. Hey, is there anything I can do for you? Is everything all right? Is you know, just give him, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm not telling you that nothing miraculous happened. I didn't lead him to the Lord or anything. I just wanted to give him a little, little piece, and I wanted to, I wanted to give him an opportunity maybe to share, like, hey, I'm just really struggling. And if he would have said that, I would have been ready, because I was looking for that opportunity. There's times in my life, un, uh, ashamedly, I've gone, I missed it. I don't know if there's times in your guys' life, but I've walked away and gone, I just missed an opportunity. And you know why I missed it? Because I forgot my mission. I probably didn't have my time with the Lord. And I was in a rush, and I was, I was doing the, the, what we all do. We get in a rush, and we're doing our, our thing. And I, I, there's, there's multitudes of times where I've just walked away going, I just missed an opportunity of giving someone a piece of heaven. Um, so... The third, the third time that I fell on my knees <laughs> is just recently, and I had to ask my wife, like, how much can I share about this? Because it's, it's, it's real. Is that um, it's in the past two or three years we went through uh, three weddings, and uh, we had her father die, and Jessica's dad. So it's just been an emotional roller coaster. Just Wow, you know, just letting children go, you're handing them over, you're doing these crazy and wild things, and you're all over the country doing weddings and whatnot. Um, so you just the emotional whatever is just happening, and they're great things, you know. And her father died, and it's just like in, in between one of the weddings, and it's just like, oh goodness, like how you know, you really felt this impact. Um, admits that Jessica, um, I guess you would say, forms a cancer. And amidst the wedding things, and we said, we, can, we can't even think about that right now. It's just small. And we were thinking, eh, should we worry worrying about it? And we're like, no, we're not going to worry about it. And then, then after the weddings, and uh, a little bit while later, we got to a point where it was like, maybe we should start thinking about this. And then we thought about it, and we did the doctor thing, and all of a sudden it's like, this is real. <laughs> and... Um, Long story short is she had to have surgery, and we thank the Lord that we, 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 we got ahead of it, um, and we uh, dealt with it. But here's what happened. It was definitely a reminder of the community around us. And people, you know, it's one thing when you give heaven to other people. It's another thing when you receive it. And so when you, when you receive a bit of heaven from others, that and, and reminder of like that that this it's okay 
that we're here for you and we're and, and you receive this you know that people are praying for you you know that people are there for you you know that you know i i call it the automatic people in my life that just they're right there it's not even a thought it's not like hey sh- let me think about this should i go help josh it's like you know that it's just automatic right so you have these automatic people in your life that that are just there for you and they're giving you a piece of heaven um and it, it's it was just wonderful um I just want to, I guess, my encouragement to us as a church, because Element was a part of that process, even though was, you know, not everyone knew about it, but a number of you, number of, of individuals in this room knew about it, and they were just giving us that piece of heaven. And I really want to encourage us as a community to want to be on mission as Jesus was on mission, and he was rock solid in that, um, and two, to get alone with the Lord, to settle your issues so you can be on mission. And three, to take action. Um, you can do those other things, but if you don't take action, it's like, what's that mean? Because if people didn't take action on my behalf, it would have been a whole different scenario on all three of those occasions. Um, and so it's, I just want to remind us that it's a hurting world, that we have two forces working against us in this world, heaven and hell. <laughs> in this passage, it, it, they're, conflict, they're, they're going right at each other. And Jesus conquered heaven. Je- Jesus conquered hell and brought heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then later in the, later in the prayer, Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us the hell that we give other people. Right? And so he, he talks about this. He says, we're going to struggle with this. We will have moments where we feel like that we do give hell to other people. And we need to, we need to ask for forgiveness for that. You know? And so it's, but what we do need to do is the opposite. Give, give them the peace of heaven. And we're not going to be going around raising people. Or we're not going around shoving demons out of people like Jesus did, but we sure can give a word of encouragement, give a word, give a, a thought to somebody that is in need. Um, that's what we can do. In Galatians, this is the Galatians passage. And again, uh, I just want to read it because it, God put it on my heart. Uh, in Galatians, talks about what the characteristics of hell are and then it talks about what the characteristics of heaven are. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord. Some of those first ones are like, yep, I don't do witchcraft, I don't do debauchery, I'm not part of orgies, whatnot, right? But then the other ones start hitting home a little bit discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Ouch. That's why I just label it, that, that's hell to me, right? Because that's, that's the characteristics of what the devil wants us to implore on other people opposite is, of that is here's the fruits of the Spirit. This is how you give heaven to people. <laughs> and this is, this is just one example throughout all of Pauline epistles. And you can go read through the Pauline epistles and through the Gospels of what heaven should look like when we give to other people. The fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control against such things there is no law those who belong to Christ Jesus those who are on this heavenward 
heavenward, eternal thinking, have crucified the flesh, that the hell thinking, right? Give them hell, with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. It, it, it's conviction. I mean, I, I just read that every time. I go, I need some time right now to go repent. Because <laughs> it, it just happens. Life happens, right? It, it just constant. If you're waiting for a Sunday to repent, it's probably too late. It's like you can repent on Sunday if you need to repent. But for me, I, 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 every morning I get up and, and, and kind of renew, recalibrate, and go, what mission am I on? And is there something I need to repent of? Because I want to give a piece of heaven to somebody today. And that comes in little bits. Um, so just an ending, the 5% that I want you to catch is give a piece of heaven to, to someone this week. How do you do that? You, you pray. God, give me an opportunity. May I make it clear and give me boldness. The boldness is the action. You can pray, I need an opportunity. Make, help me to make it clear. You can have everything in your head right. But if that third one's not there, give me boldness to take the step of faith, to say the word I need to say, or to go back, get out of the car, and go, you know what, I think God was telling me to go talk to that person. Get out of your car and go talk to that person. That's the boldness. That's the, cur the courage that you need to have to say that. Pick up the phone. Do the text. There's so many modes of oper operandum. You can do it now. You don't have to, you know, whatever. But if anything you catch, I just pray that the Spirit of God will lead and direct you to just give a piece of heaven to people, someone this week. And whatever capacity that looks like. Because we all have it. We are all, we are all have that ability to do that. Because we have the Spirit. Jesus didn't just leave us. He left us the Holy Spirit to interact with to, to accomplish these things. That's why heaven is now. <laughs> it's happening. And it has a little mix of whatever in it because hell is happening at the same time. And we will be glorified and we will be a part of that. That's what we have to combat. That's the wrestling that we have to deal with. And that's what we have to repent of daily. So I can just pray, again, the 5% is to give heaven to someone this week. Give them a glimpse of that. As you give glimpses of that, they might see a difference of like, I want to be a part of that. Heaven given. <laughs> heaven giving, right? So I thank you for the opportunity. I didn't say that at the beginning of the week. <laughs> as I was wrestling with the Holy Spirit, as I was wrestling with God, I was in the muck trying to figure out what I was going to say. But I do thank you for the opportunity because it has grown me spiritually and it has given me more light into how I need to live my life. So, thank you. Thanks, Josh, for that word. And there's a lot there to think about. Uh, I, I love that 5%. Those are like drilled in my head now. And I don't think I'll forget them uh, through the week. So thank you. As we move towards uh, looking to the communion and the Lord's table, we call it the Lord's table. Uh, it says in uh, in 1 Corinthians that, Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and after breaking it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And in the like manner, he took the cup, and he, he poured it out, and he said, take
take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. As often as you eat, eat this bread and drink this drink, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Notice what Jesus did before he distributed the bread and before he distributed the drink. It says that he broke the bread. And it says that the drink was poured out first, and after he poured it out, then the cup was passed around and distributed. And we have to understand that if the bread, which was his body, was not broken, and if the blood was not poured out before it was distributed, there would have been no purpose in its distribution and no power. And remember, this is the last meal that Jesus was going to have before his death, that later that night he was going to be arrested put on trial, and by noon the next day, he would be uh, hanging on the cross, dying a death by crucifixion. It's all throughout the Bible that blood is necessary for forgiveness. Without blood, there's no forgiveness. It's used all throughout the Old Testament. You're not allowed to eat or drink blood because the life is in the blood. And it was through that life that Jesus gave when he laid down his life that made the distribution of his body and of his blood have an effect for us. So let's just keep that in mind as we come to the table that it says for the joy set before him, he did that. And that joy was you and that joy was me. And that was why he willingly allowed his body to be crushed and his blood to be poured out. We have stations here at the front on either side and a number of places in the back. Uh, at any point during this last song, come forward and take part. Uh, you don't need to be a part of this church in particular. We just ask that you have placed your faith in Christ and that you've come with the empty hands of faith, knowing that it is the work of Christ we're celebrating, not something that we bring to the table. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you didn't hold back, but that you saw us the joy that was set before you and that you're willing to lay down your life for us so that we could have life. Help us to, to uh, take part in these elements in, in a really joyful and, and thoughtful way this morning and that we'd be present in that. In your name we pray, amen.
guys couldn't say no to me. <laughs> um, but be praying for him. And then uh, in another week, you get to hear from a good friend of mine um, from down south, from lacrosse. But this is what the body of Christ is about. This is what it's about. Go make God known, make him famous. Love you guys. Have a great week.